Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, we're going to dive into LexD. LexD is a containerization technology and it's one of my favorites. So I'm really excited to do this video today. Now, even though this technology is spelled LXD, it's pronounced LexD, which is the first thing to learn. But actually what I'm going to do is teach you all about LexD. I'm going to give you all of the common commands that you would want to use to manage containers and you will actually run a container via LexD by the end of the video. Now, before we get started, I want to send a special thank you out to A2 Hosting because they were gracious enough to provide the server that we'll be using in today's video. And this server in particular is not a virtual machine. It's a physical server that resides in their data center. It's part of their unmanaged physical server offering for developers and it has some really good specs too an AMD Epic CPU, 64 gigabytes of memory, and NVMe storage. So definitely check out A2 Hosting's website to see what they have to offer. They offer both managed and unmanaged servers that you can customize to fit your needs. I really appreciate A2 Hosting for providing the server for today's video. Now, let's dive into LexD. Now, before we get started, there's some general information that I want to make sure you guys are aware of. And the most important of which is what exactly is LexD anyway? Well, first of all, LexD is a container manager. You can think of LexD as the interface through which you'll create containers. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that LexD itself is not a container type. Again, it's a container manager, so its goal is to, well, manage containers. So if LexD is not a container type of and by itself, then what kind of container does it allow you to run? LexD allows you to run Linux containers, or LXC for short, and just like LexD, LXC is pronounced LexC. But LexD is more than just a containerization management layer. It gives you access to additional features, such as clustering. Okay, so we understand what LexD is, but what exactly is a Linux container? LexC containers are more VM-like than other container types. Docker, for example, utilizes layers. Every change you make to a Docker container is saved as a new layer. And when you stop a Docker container, it loses all of its stateful information. LexC containers, on the other hand, are, like I mentioned, more like virtual machines. That means if you stop a LexC container, then you're not actually going to lose anything it's pretty much the same as shutting down a VM. And Linux containers are called Linux containers because they utilize technologies in the Linux kernel itself to do what they do. Specifically, two of the more important components are cgroups and namespaces. Now, a complete overview of the Linux kernel and how it interfaces with containers is beyond the scope of this video, and you don't really have to understand that fully to utilize LexC or LexD. Just keep in mind that LexD is the management layer, LexC is the type of container that it helps you manage, and LexC containers utilize features in the Linux kernel itself in order to function. So here I am connected to my server from A2 Hosting, as you can see, and the distribution that I'm running here, as you can see, is Ubuntu server. Ubuntu server is my favorite distribution for servers in general, but you don't have to run Ubuntu in order to follow along with this tutorial. And that's because LexD is provided as a snap package, so any distribution that has access to snap packages will be able to utilize LexD. Now, there's a few things that I recommend you do on your server if you haven't already, just to make sure we're in the best possible place to begin. Now, the first thing I recommend you do is create a user for yourself. I've already done that though, I have a user named Jay that I'm going to be using for this tutorial. 
On your end, if you haven't already created a user for yourself, basically if you're logged in as root, then you'll definitely want to create a user for yourself so you won't be running as root all the time. On Ubuntu, you can run add user as root along with the username that you want to add. But again, I've already done that. As you can see here, I'm logged in as my local user account. Now, if you did create a user for yourself, you'll probably want to make sure that your user is a member of the sudo group, and some distros call this group wheel, because that'll make sure that your user account is able to execute commands as root with sudo. As root, you can run user mod dash lowercase a uppercase g sudo and then your username to add your user to the sudo group. But I'll leave that up to you. If you did create a user for yourself, then you could switch to that user by running su hyphen and then the username. So it'll look something like that. I'm already logged in as myself, so I don't need to do that. But if you need to switch from root to a local user account, then that's one way you can do that. The next thing that I recommend you do is update all of the packages on your server. This is very important. You always want to make sure that your server has the latest and greatest security patches installed, and that'll help make sure that you're better protected from outside threats. So as my normal user account, I can use sudo apt update double ampersand sudo apt dist upgrade. And the ampersands there actually separate two different commands that I'm chaining together. The first command here is going to update the package repository index to ensure that the local index of available packages is completely up to date. The latter command will actually install any updates that might be available. Now, I always keep my servers up to date, so on my end, there's nothing new to install. On your end, if that did actually result in packages being installed, you might want to reboot your server to make sure that everything is fresh. And to do that, you simply run sudo reboot, just like that, and that'll reboot your server. Next, let's make sure that we have access to the snap command. You can type which and then snap, and when you run that command, if you do see output, that means that snap is available. On my end, there wasn't any output here, so I need to actually install the snapd package to give myself access to the snap command. Snapd is actually the interface that allows you to install snap packages, and snap packages are universal packages, and what that means is that if a developer makes their software available via a snap package, then they don't have to make a separate version available for Debian, SUSE, Fedora, CentOS, and so on. They can create one snap package, and any distribution that is able to install snap packages will be able to install that package as well. Basically, the developer only has to compile it one time. So on Debian and Ubuntu, the command that we can use to set up snap is very simple. sudo apt install snapd, just like this. That's all we should have to do. I'll press enter. And that should be all there is to it. As you can see, now I have access to the snap command, so we're ready to go. On your end, if you are not using Ubuntu or Debian, then you should still be able to get snapd installed, but there's a separate command for each distribution that's supported, so you'll need to find whatever the command is for your distro of choice in order to set up snap. So what I'll do now is open up a browser, and what I'm going to do is go to snapcraft.io, and then docs, and then this link right here, installing snap. And here we have a list of all the distributions that are known to support snap. So if you are running one of these distributions, then all you should have to do is click on it, and that'll walk you through the process of setting up the snap daemon, which again is the service that's required to facilitate the running of snap packages. I'll leave that up to you if you are running a different distribution. Anyway, back on our terminal, let's continue. On your end, you might have already had snapd installed, and if that's true, you might want to look at the snap packages that are available on your system right now, the ones that are already installed, because you might already have what you need to utilize LexD. To find out, you can simply run snap list, and as you can see here, I don't have any snaps installed at the moment, but if you have LexD installed on your side, 
then you don't have to run the next command that I'm about to show you. In order to get LexD installed, we'll have to install the snap package for it. And that's pretty easy to do. So we just type sudo snap install and then LexD, just like that. So it's going to download it and then install it. And that was it. We now have support for LexD on our server. We only needed to install that one package and we're good to go. The next thing that I suggest you do is add yourself to the LexD group. This will enable you to interact with LexD without having to use sudo or root. So I'll run sudo and then user mod, dash lowercase a, uppercase g, the name of the group that we want to add our user to, which again is LexD, and then the username that we want to add to that group, I'll add myself, and that should be others to it. So now what I'm going to do is log out and then log back in just to make sure that I have that group membership assigned. And that's because the group memberships are read as soon as you log in. So in order for that to take effect, I'll just have to log out and log back in again. Then I'll type groups. And sure enough, I am a member of LexD. Pretty cool. Now that we have LexD installed, we can run snap list. And we should see LexD in the list right here. And we do. And that should also mean that we have access to the lexc command as well. And you can see that I do. Now, in order for us to be able to use lexd, we have to initialize it. For that, we can run sudo lexd init. What this command is going to do is walk us through setting it up for the very first time. It's going to ask us some questions. And our answer to those questions will enable us to set up lexd exactly the way we want it. For each of these questions, we could simply press enter to accept the default answer. If we want to give it a different answer, then we could type yes or no, or whatever it's asking for. But I'm going to press enter for this one. It's asking us if we would like to enable clustering. That's beyond the scope of this video. So I'll press enter to select the default of no. Storage pools are one of the greatest features of LexD in my opinion. And right now it's asking us if we would like to set up a new storage pool. So I'll press enter to say yes. We definitely want that. And now it's asking us to name the pool. And I'll just accept the default. And LexD features different storage types, as you can see here. And on Ubuntu, it defaults to ZFS. Now, I'm not going to choose ZFS in my case. That's highly recommended if you can choose that or if you have the hardware to support that. I would actually need another dedicated drive in order to effectively manage ZFS. So what I'm going to do instead is set it to directory or DIR for it to use a directory on the file system. Again, ZFS is highly recommended, but it's better to use ZFS with a dedicated block device, which I don't currently have available. And now it's asking us if we would like to connect to a Moz server, which stands for Metal as a Service. This is currently beyond the scope of today's video, but it is something that I'm thinking about covering in a separate tutorial. If you'd like me to do a video on Metal as a Service, then click the like button and drop me a note in the comments and let me know. If enough people ask for it, I might consider doing it. And now it's asking us if we would like to create a new bridge. I'm going to keep the default of yes for this. We definitely want this. For the name of the bridge, I'm just going to keep it at its default of LexDBR0. That's fine for me. And then I'll select the default for this. This as well. And now it's asking us if we would like to make this available over the network. It defaults to no, and I'm going to leave it on no. The thing is, you should never make anything externally available on your servers unless you have a very specific use case to do that. When in doubt, just restrict it. And that's not actually specific to LexD. Overall, it's just a really good mindset to have to not make things publicly available unless you have to. And I'll select the default for this as well, and then enter again. And that's it. LexD is now initialized. And now that LexD is set up, it's time to actually use it. The way that it works is that LexD is able to pull images from remote servers. And to find out which remote servers we have available, we can run LexC, remote, and then list. And my font size is actually quite large here, so I'll just temporarily make that a bit smaller so you can better see it. 
you can see a list of remotes that I have available right here. Now, as an aside, notice that I set up LexD, but the command that I used was LexC, and that was on purpose. As I mentioned earlier, LexC is the container type, and LexD is the management layer. Only certain commands and features of LexD are going to require the LexD command, and actually all the commands that we're going to go over in this video are all going to be LexC commands. But if you start to set up things like clustering and migration and things like that, then you'll likely use the LexD command set for that, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Anyway, let's continue. So you just saw a list of remotes that I had on my end, and you can actually list the contents of a remote server, basically the images that are stored there with the command that I'm about to give you. Now, this command might be a little confusing at first. I'm running lexc image, which means I want to work with images, basically, and I want to list images, and the upstream repository that I want to list images from is a repository called images, and that's there at the end. So when I press enter, it's going to basically spit out a list of images at that remote. Again, the remote is called images. And there's quite a few here. So if I scroll up here, you'll see that there's quite a few different images available. And each one is based on a different distribution of Linux. So even though I'm running on Ubuntu, this means I could run a Fedora image if I wanted to. There's nothing stopping me. That's pretty cool. Now, if I wanted to actually search for specific criteria, such as keywords, I could actually add the keyword here to the end of this command. So I want to search for images that have Debian in the name. And there's going to be quite a few here, as you can see. We have Debian 9, 10, 11, and some others here. So we have quite a few different versions of Debian available here. So if you are a fan of Debian, then you'll probably like this a lot. And you can actually add more than one keyword. So here I am searching for Ubuntu Focal Images. And Focal is the code name of Ubuntu 2004. At the time I'm recording this video, Ubuntu 20.04 is the latest LTS release of Ubuntu. And actually, I have an entire book available about Ubuntu 20.04. So if you are interested in learning Ubuntu Server, then definitely check out that book. Anyway, you can see here that we have quite a few images for Ubuntu as well. That's pretty cool. So we're just about ready to run our first container. You can first run the lexi list command to list all of the containers that we have running currently, which at this time should be none. And as you can see here, we have no containers running. That makes sense. So once we do launch our container, we should see it in this list. So to launch a container, we can run the lexi launch command. And then we type the name of the repository that we want to pull an image from. So we will use the images repository. And as an example, I'm going to pull the Ubuntu focal image, and then I'm going to give the container a name of Ubuntu. So as you can see, the lexi launch command is what we're using. The images repository is the one that we want to grab the image from. The name of the image is Ubuntu slash focal, and the name of the container that we want to create is simply Ubuntu. You can name your container whatever you'd like. I wasn't feeling very creative today, but anyway, I'll press enter. And that went by very quickly. So if we check the list of containers again, we should see an Ubuntu container running, and we do. We even have the IP address of the container right here. So far, so good. So now that we have a container running, what can we do with it? Well, one thing we can do is launch a command against it. And for that, we can use lexi exec. We want to execute something. And then we type the name of the container that we want to use, and then two dashes. And then finally, we type the actual command that we would like to run inside the container. In my case, I'll run apt install Apache 2. Press enter, then enter again. And now we should actually have Apache running inside the container. Again, here's the IP address. And what I'm going to do is run curl, and then the IP address. 
And if this works, I should see the code for the default start page for Apache. Let's see. And there we go. Although it's not much to look at, this is actually the default start page for Apache, and that was run from the container, which is great. That means that we've not only created our very first container, we were able to install Apache in there, and we know that Apache is running because it's serving the default start page. Now one thing I want to mention is the purpose of the two hyphens that you see in this command right here. The lexi exec command allows us to run a command against a container, so we used it against a container called Ubuntu, and then we have the two dashes. So you can think of the two dashes as a type of separator between the lexc command and the command that we want to execute against the container. And we can add any command we want that's a valid Linux command right here on the right side of the two dashes. So I could simply list the storage of the Etsy directory from inside the container if I wanted to. Not very exciting, but it works. Now, another thing that I want to do is have a second container that we can work with. And this time, I want to base it on Debian. So what I'm doing right here is I am just using the lexi launch command again. And again, I'm using the images repository. I'm going to pull down the image for Debian 10, and then I'm going to use it to create a container cleverly named Debian. And now right here, you can see that we have a Debian container as well as an Ubuntu container. And just to prove that the Debian container is working, let's run a command against it. So I'm just going to check the contents of the Etsy OS release file from within the Debian container. Simple enough. So as you can see, the Debian container is running Debian 10, codename Buster. So far, so good. So now that we have some containers to work with, Let's see some examples of additional commands that we can use to manage them. So again, here's the list. And another example command that I want to give you is lexi stop. And this command is going to do exactly what you think it's going to do. As you can see from the output, the state of the Debian container is now stopped. And if we want to start it up, well, as you could probably guess, we simply change stop to start. And now it's running again. And in addition to stopping and starting containers, we can restart them as well. We're not really going to see any visual indicator that this is working, but we do have the ability to restart, so we should keep that in mind. So what do you do when you have a container that you no longer need and you want to get rid of it? And that's actually very easy to do. So to delete a container, we first stop the container. And now we can see that the Ubuntu container is stopped. And then to actually get rid of the container, we run lexc and then delete, followed by the name of the container. As you can see, we're down to just the Debian container now we were successfully able to delete the Ubuntu container. So now we know how to create containers and we know how to get rid of them as well. Now notice that right here, we have the number zero underneath snapshots. One of my favorite features of LexC is the ability to create snapshots. And this is another example of how LexC containers are more like virtual machines. If you are familiar with virtual machines, then you've probably used snapshots at one point or another. And the same concept pretty much applies here as well. And snapshots are very useful if you want to try something out. Maybe you want to install a piece of software, see how it affects the container. And then if you don't like the changes, roll that back as if nothing ever happened. Snapshots are a very effective way of testing configuration changes. And the fact that we can do the same thing here in Lexi that's pretty cool. So to create a snapshot, we'll type lexc and then snapshot. We'll type the name of the container that we want to create a snapshot of. And then we give the snapshot itself a name. 
I'll just call mine my snap one. So now when I check the list, notice that I have one here for the number of snapshots. So if I create another snapshot, then of course that increments up to two. So it's neat to have a little counter here that tells us exactly how many snapshots we have for a container. So now that I have a few snapshots, how can I see a bit more information about those snapshots? I gave them names and all I saw in the lexi list command was the number of snapshots that I had. So what we can actually do is type lexi info and then the name of the container. And here at the bottom, it gives us the names of the snapshots that were created against this particular container. It also gives us some other information as well that's very useful. I'll leave it up to you to look through this information right here. With the lexi info command, it gives us quite a bit of info, so that's pretty useful. So what if we want to delete a snapshot? So for that, we type lexi delete, the name of the container, and then the name of the snapshot that we want to get rid of. And as you can see here, I deleted my snap one, but I still have my snap two. And to restore a snapshot, that's pretty easy as well. As you can see, all the Lexi commands are fairly easy and straightforward, and this one is no exception. So to restore a snapshot, we type Lexi restore, the name of the container, space, and then the name of the snapshot. Just like that. And that was successful. I didn't actually make any changes, but what I could have done is made some changes to the container and then rolled them back with the snapshot. So again, if you've ever used snapshots in virtual machines, it's the same concept here. So before I close out the video, there's a few more commands that I would like to give you guys. And one of them is setting up the container so that it starts up automatically whenever you start up the host server. And the option is called auto start. So what we're going to do is type lexc config set the name of the container. And the option that we want to change is boot.autostart. We'll set that equal to one. And now at this point, the Debian container should automatically start anytime we reboot the server. But there's another command that I would like to give you as well. And that's a method of setting a ceiling for memory. So that way, if something goes spiraling out of control, the container will not be able to use all of the host server's memory. So again, we're going to run lexi config set. And again, we're going to run it against the Debian container, which is, well, the only one we have at this point. And then we're going to configure limits.memory. And we're going to set that equal to one gigabyte. So for this container, we've already configured two different options, but how do we see all of the configuration for a container? We especially want to verify that the changes that we've just made were actually made. And for that, we run lexi config show, and then the name of the container. And let's scroll up a little bit. And right here, we can see the memory limit. And then we can also see boot.autostart here as well. So if you'd like to check and see whether or not a container has the auto start boot option enabled, you could do that through this command, and you could also check the other options here as well. And again, that was lexi config show, and then the name of the container. Now what I'm going to do is give you guys a few more commands. These are commands that I think will be very helpful at one point or another. And specifically, what I'm going to show you how to do is configure the order in which containers start. Sometimes you might want a container to start a bit later than the other ones. For example, maybe you have a database server that needs to be started first, and that's a common scenario because often you want to make sure that something like a database server is up and running first, especially when other containers depend on it. And there's two different ways that we can try to tackle this. And one way that we can handle this is to add a delay to the auto start. So in this example, I'm adding a 30 second delay before this container is allowed to start up.
And now we can see that option right here. Now adding a delay might not be the best way to solve this problem though. We might want to consider actually specifying the order and we can do that as well. Now in this example command, eight is just an arbitrary number, but you could basically set the order in which all the containers start up by giving them each a numerical value. So a lower number is going to be started before a higher number. So in this example, I set this to eight. If I did have a database server and I set that to one, then we could be reasonably sure that that's going to start up first and then the other servers will start up later on. LexD is awesome. As you can see, it's very easy to get started with this technology. In this video, I showed you how to set it up, and then we created some containers, and we even changed the customization options for those containers to do things like set up an auto start delay, auto start order, things like that. It's a very easy technology to get started with, but there's more to it than this. We've only just begun to scratch the surface. If you guys want to see more videos just like this, more content on LexD, then let me know in the comments down below and make sure you click the like button on this video to let me know that you did like this video and that you want to see more about this technology. Like I mentioned, we just scratched the surface of LexD in this video. So in a future video, if I do one, maybe I could show you something like setting up clustering or something like that. That might be fun. So again, click that like button if you like this video and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.